The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a somewhat opinionated uh, conversation uh, and talk, uh, so I am sure that you will find plenty to disagree with me about, especially Russ, who's sitting in the back. Um, I will apologize to you in advance. Um, uh, feel free to grab my contact information and flame me either on Twitter or via email. Um, so we're going to talk about um, building a test dev cloud, and I think uh, test dev is, a, um, is an ideal application for getting your feet wet with uh, infrastructure as a service cloud computing. Um, but real briefly, uh, let me tell you a little bit about me. So I'm a recovering sysadmin. Um, I worked in, worked in operations for about a decade. Uh, this means I, I still know that it's down, not across. Um, but uh, for about the past two years, I've been really working more on the dev side um, and uh, working on Apache Cloud Stack now. Um, so I, uh, I'm a PMC member, which is the Project Management Committee for Apache Cloud Stack. Uh, and uh, I'm also a member of the Apache Software Foundation now. Um, historically, I've been very involved in a couple of other open source projects, uh, really pointing back to kind of my operations roots. So um, I was a contributor to Xenos uh, and wrote a number of uh, monitoring plugins for Xenos over the years and uh, also uh, used to work uh, a lot in the Fedora project, and now I do uh, a lot less of that, um, although I'm still somewhat active. Um, and for about the past year and a half, I've been employed uh, by Citrix and work in the open source business office now uh, at Citrix. So why, are, why would we use uh, a cloud environment for dev test? Um, I think that you would do this uh, for a number of reasons, but let me explain to you what the process looks like from a developer standpoint. You get a new project to work on, and the first thing you do is you go request resources to begin working on that project, and you wait. And it's not just waiting a day or two. Um, so I went and talked to, uh, anyone in here from Clemson before I in my mouth, I got Scott Clemson. So I went and talked to the folks at Clemson. They have, um, they have a high performance computing lab uh, there. Uh, and I sat down with some of the folks uh, at Clemson and said, you know, tell me about your processes. If, if a researcher comes up and wants to uh, get access to do something uh, in this lab, what does that process look like? It takes them eight weeks to get access to a virtual machine. Um, that's not having to order hardware. That's not having to rack, uh, rack that hardware. That is to turn on a virtual machine, get the IP address allocated. So, so when a developer wants to come and work on something, they have to ask for resources. They wait, wait, wait. Um, those resources then get handed to them, but the resources aren't configured because that's handled by someone else. So they wait again to get that configured. Um, and then, uh, I only put one wait state here, um, but getting network access is very painful. Uh, so I actually, uh, Joe and I went and installed a lab um, in North Carolina. Uh, we had gotten permission for the power. We had actually gotten them to set up the rack, cable the rack, uh, and we just went in to, to drop the equipment in. We still have not gotten network access. Uh, almost a month later. And we had been asking for access since February. Um, so particularly as you get larger and larger, getting network access is a, is a big pain. Um, so I've got now uh, around 10 machines um, and uh, probably $10,000 worth of networking equipment that's sitting idle because I can't get 
uh, network access done fast enough. So this is what it looks like from a developer's um, standpoint, and hopefully after all of this waiting, they can actually get things done. Um, I talked to a, another company, uh, which is actually a web-focused company, so you would think they would know how to do this a little faster. Um, they said that when a developer asks for resources, keep in mind, these are not production resources. These are just, I need to go uh, hack on something and need an environment to do that in. Uh, they're looking at three months right now from the time it's first requested until it's actually usable. So this is, uh, this is the, kind of the problem domain. Um, the real problem is, is that operations is providing something that developers aren't looking for. Um, and quite honestly, that they don't want. So um, that is, that's really the problem statement. Uh, and dev test is really a, a place you can, you can move things forward. So um, what we're talking about hopefully is removing constraints uh, and making sure that when we have processes in place that they actually add value to the business. Um, while, we want to, uh, while we want to send everyone away and replace them with very small Perl scripts, we also need to have uh, some uh, enforcement of policy and compliance, and also to keep, uh, uh, to keep things in check because we don't want to give people a blank check. Um, we also want uh, those developers to actually be able to get things done. Uh, paying a developer to sit around and wait for three months while you provision a virtual machine um, is not an effective use of your developers. Um, how many folks in here have, first of all, how many folks are developers how many folks are ops people? Okay. Um, for the ops people, how many of your environments are running, uh, have, you have developers running workloads in AWS? Only one person admitted it. Okay. Um, so I will tell you what I found. Um, I am cursed or blessed, depending upon your perspective, to go and get to talk to lots of different people. Uh, and I found that even in large, um, Fortune 500 companies that have all kinds of regulatory compliance uh, frameworks uh, that when they go and do an audit, uh, they are paying multiple thousands of dollars a month to a bookseller. Um, and essentially development managers are going out and expensing uh, AWS environments, even in places that you would say, oh, that company that makes incredibly expensive software and, and makes multiple billions of dollars a year off of software that they develop, um, uh, they're actually pushing a lot of their development environments into AWS because they can get things done so much faster there. Uh, and when the companies discover that, it absolutely terrifies them. So if you have more than 10 employees, 10 developers rather, and you, uh, and you do not work in a SCIF, I am willing to bet that uh, somewhere people are using, are actually doing their work in Amazon or in some similar environment, uh, unless you work for some place that is terribly forward thinking. So let me describe what I think a, a dev test cloud looks like. Um, the first thing I, th I think a cloud, any cloud, uh, regardless of what you're using it for looks like is that it is self-service. Uh, if you are injecting yourself into, if you are injecting operations rather into uh, this workflow, uh, you're doing it wrong and uh, developers ought to be able to provision a virtual machine. Uh, there is nothing that you add value to in, in a provisioning standpoint um, to, uh, to inject yourself in. So uh, they ought to be able to get a virtual machine. They ought to have a set of rules enforced around that. So, um, so you ought to be able to limit how much CPU they can consume. You ought to be able to limit how much network bandwidth they can consume. Uh, but they ought to be able to go out and get this done. If they can't go out and get this done organizationally, uh, you've got another set of challenges. Um, so I've got to talk tomorrow about uh, uh, DevOps cloud computing 
and the death of backup tape changers. Uh, and I think that um, one of the, the pain points that people are starting to experience is that a lot of the traditional jobs, uh, especially the low level entry jobs in IT are rapidly vanishing. And um, I think much like the guy who used to change those big um, backup tape reels, uh, those jobs are disappearing. And, uh, and DevOps, cloud computing, and a lot of the automation advances are, uh, are making those jobs go away. Uh, if you are injecting yourself in here, I would argue that you are uh, doing yourself a disservice and you are actively trying to get yourself fired. Um, and, and I mean that purely from a business standpoint, because there's, uh, if you can automate compliance and you can automate uh, all of the processes that you care about, uh, injecting yourself as a manual wait state uh, is doing the business of this service, and uh, I, I really do think that you're creating a threat for yourself. Um, so we talked about uh, developers being able to do things on their own. You also need to be able to measure what they're doing. Um, you need to be able to tell that uh, the new project that people are working on for an ERP system is consuming in amount of resources. Uh, you need to be able to show people, hey, this department is consuming a third of our resources uh, for storage, and if they continue on this rate, we're going to have to purchase more. Uh, because you, know, you need to be able to allocate that cost back to them. Uh, whether you're going to do a chargeback or you're just showing where, the, uh, where your resources are going. I also think that you need to be able to isolate people. Uh, it's great that you allow developers to go and provision their own stuff, but from an ops perspective, you want to uh, control what they can do with that. Uh, and so you want to be very, uh, very careful with the amount of access that you provide them out into the real world. Um, I think you want to do this as cheaply as possible. Uh, having a multi-million dollar SAN for your test dev environment uh, does not add value in the vast majority of cases. Uh, there are some corner cases. Um, the other thing that, that inevitably happens is people begin liking the fact that they can uh, self-service provision things uh, and they'll start putting production workloads. And this is something that you actually have to either guard against or plan for. Um, my favorite story is uh, a movie company um, in California set up a cloud stack environment uh, as a test dev environment. They decided that, uh, that their initial implementation wasn't the best, that they wanted to change a lot of things. They started the process for tearing it down uh, and suddenly uh, panic uh, started uh, spreading throughout uh, the dev side of the house because the web page of the company as well as a lot of their revenue generating um, video streams and games uh, were actually running on their test dev environment um, and they liked it so much it was so easy for them to get things done. They just moved all of that off of the, their legacy systems into their uh, test dev cloud without bothering to tell the ops folks. So uh, you really do have to either guard or plan for that. And a test dev cloud does not resemble what you would want to run production services on. So let's talk about self-service because I think we gloss over this quite a bit. Um, I, I've said before, I don't think that manual provisioning adds value. Uh, if your job today involves you carrying around a, uh, a CD and clicking through the Windows installer or clicking through a Linux installer for that matter, um, your job is going to be very short-lived. Quite honestly, it should not have existed in the past five years. Um, we have things like RIS for Windows. We have Kickstart for Linux uh, or uh, Precede, depending upon your distro of choice. Um, there is no re reason for people to be carrying around a, a CD anymore to install machines. Uh, this self-service can be completely automated. The question that you need to answer for your environment is, do I need to provide them just uh, you know, a blank Ubuntu machine or a blank CentOS machine, or do they need a fully configured environment? Do I need to spin up an entire Hadoop cluster for them? 
uh, or do I just provide them access to, uh, to virtual machines, raw virtual machines? The next set of considerations is what are you actually providing? What's the interface? Um, are you going to provide them some user interface? Uh, are you going to provide them API access? Uh, are you actually going to provide some higher level tool? So I think user interfaces are great. You should show them to your managers. Um, but you should not do real work in a user interface. Um, CloudStack has a gorgeous user interface, but it's, even if you keep all of the defaults, it's six clicks to deploy a single virtual machine. Um, nobody in their right mind wants to do that if they have to do it more than once. Um, so UIs are great, show them to your managers, they're beautiful, but don't do real work in them. So using, using an API or a command line tool, uh, so CloudStack has uh, a command line tool called CloudMonkey um, that allows you, so this is a deployed virtual machine with uh, telling it the uh, CPU and, and RAM configuration, uh, the disk image, and which availability zone that you're deploying it in. Um, and I did something slightly more parsable for, uh, for actual direct API interaction. Um, those are fine. Most developers can, can easily do uh, either of those, uh, and that may be enough. Um, but if, you're, if your developers need anything more than just a raw virtual machine, I think you ought to look at uh, using configuration management for deployment. Um, so I'm going to show something here, and I will apologize that this is probably unparsable uh, or unreadable uh, where you're sitting. So this is a, um, this is actually from uh, a tool called Knife. Uh, how many folks are familiar with Chef? Okay, so Chef is a configuration management tool from OpsCode, um, and Knife is, among other things, uh, one of their provisioning tools. So uh, let me walk you through this. This is, uh, the name of this is uh, Hadoop Cluster A. And you've got a, a real uh, short description which says it's a small uh, Hadoop cluster. Um, so we've got this section called servers and you've got three different types of servers defined. Um, the first type is Zookeeper uh, nodes. Uh, and so you can, you'll see that we're defining three different Zookeeper nodes. Uh, the disk image is a rail 5.6 image. We're opening up uh, port 2181 from a, uh, from a CPU and RAM perspective. Uh, we're using a service offering called small, uh, which is just an arbitrary service offering. Um, uh, I think for, from the environment that this came out of, this was uh, 500 megahertz worth of CPU and 512 of RAM. So then we, we have a Hadoop master. There's only a single one of these. Um, and we're opening up a, some different ports. Uh, and also, we're, you'll notice that we're specifying what networks. So this is on both the application network and the storage network. Um, and you'll, if you're familiar with Chef, so you've got this run list that's saying, hey, this is in cluster A. This is a Hadoop master uh, and, and an HBase master, and a different set of uh, different set of run lists um, for the Zookeeper nodes. And then we have the Hadoop worker nodes, and again, there are three of them, um, and a different set of CPU and RAM, different firewall rules, um, and so this is all referred to as Hadoop cluster A, which means that when a developer wants to, um, to deploy this, they don't have to know anything about what firewall rules need to be opened. They don't need to know anything about the interrelationship because Chef is handling all of this when Knife provisions it. So instead, uh, when they want this deployed, uh, this is a single command, Knife CS stack create, and then referring to the name of, the, of this uh, application stack. So think about the difference between handing one of your developers uh, 
seven blank uh, CentOS virtual machines versus handing them uh, a running Hadoop cluster uh, with a single command. So you can also do something very similar with, uh, with Puppet. Um, and uh, Puppet has a number of resources to manage different infrastructures of service cloud as, um, as types and providers. So just like you can say install um, HTTPD in Puppet, you can also say provision a virtual machine, have this uh, set of firewall rules open, uh, these ports open on the machine, et cetera, and then create a stack just like this. Um, but this was already written, so it was easy to copy paste uh, as opposed to trying to rewrite that in Puppet. So uh, this is actually uh, a screenshot from a tool called CloudCap, uh, which was written by the folks at Cloudera. Um, and so they spin up, obviously, Hadoop and Hadoop ecosystem clusters uh, in their test environments. And so you'll see, uh, you'll see that they, they're picking uh, the disk image that, that's going out. They're, they're uh, picking a service offering. But what they're really doing is um, you're saying uh, how, many, uh, how many machines are you deploying? Um, and so this is the only thing that they get access to, that their developers get access to, to deploy, uh, to deploy that. Uh, so maybe you want to provide them access to this. Uh, there's also folks who are doing reservation engines. Uh, you can deploy a virtual machine or multiple virtual machines but you only get it for a specific amount of time. So you can pick one week, one day, one month, and at the end of that time, that virtual machine goes away. So uh, self-service, uh, it's great that you provide self-service, but self-service may have uh, a lot of different concepts. And think about, uh, think about what your developers actually need when they need to provision things. How many folks know what uh, Jevons Paradox is? One person, two people. Okay, so Jevons Paradox says uh, essentially that when you create additional efficiencies, that demand for, um, for whatever you made more efficient will increase, not, not, a, not linearly with the efficiency, but, uh, uh, but by and large it will increase. So if you have, um, uh, if you increase uh, fuel efficiency, people will drive more. They will, actually, uh, they will actually get pretty close to consuming the same amount of fuel uh, simply because uh, you've made it more fuel efficient and uh, they, they're gonna put the same amount of money in, by and large, uh, into fuel. So um, in, in a infrastructure as a service uh, concept, you may have made Virtualization may have made it more efficient for you to deploy resources. Uh, infrastructure as a service may make it more efficient for people to deploy them themselves. Uh, and because they can do it so much faster and so much easier, uh, they will consume more resources. Um, so while you may be able to take you know, something that's at 8, 15% usage today and apply things like infrastructure as a service and virtualization to get uh, much better utilization rates. People will consume far more simply because uh, they can. The problem comes in that, that you have tons of waste uh, that typically creeps in because uh, those developers don't care uh, that they have provisioned a virtual machine that's sitting idle and has sat idle for months. Uh, it has no apparent cost to them unless you're doing chargeback or showback. Um, so because developers don't care uh, and, and people in general don't care when they don't see a cost to something, uh, it's important to, to start measuring usage. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things that I saw out of, the, uh, out of CloudCap that Cloudera wrote, um, their biggest concern was being able to go back and look at how much CPU was actually being consumed on the machines. Because developers would go and spin up 100 virtual machines uh, to do some Hadoop testing. And, uh, and they would leave that running. Uh, and you know, while they were on average, uh, at any one point they had in excess of 1,000 virtual machines running, um, the running 100 
additional VMs running was a ton of capacity that uh, across their organization that was being consumed. And people would just leave them running for months on end. Uh, so it looked like they were always out of resources. Uh, and the reality is, yes, they were, uh, those resources were being consumed, but they weren't actually being utilized. Um, uh, so one of the, th the things uh, that CloudCat does is it goes and looks and tells you when's the last time there was any real CPU load on these nodes and allows you to do some reporting. Uh, so CloudStack, as an infrastructure as a service platform, will measure things like CPU load, uh, CPU utilized and uh, registered to an account, um, as well as uh, uh, being able to, to set up things like a project that multiple groups are going to work on. You can set up a dedicated set of resources that are accounted separately, uh, and you want to make usage of that, uh, no pun intended. Um, you, want to, you want to actually uh, consume the, the usage reports and start showing those off uh, and also monitoring them uh, to start seeing where all of your resources are going. So we're going to start getting into a lot more um, opinion here. So feel free to disagree. Feel free to also interject with questions. So um, for a dev test cloud, I think that uh, I think from a price and a value standpoint that you cannot do better than local storage. Um, first of all, direct attached storage is cheap. It's also incredibly fast compared to network storage. Uh, there are some downsides, right? So um, while CloudStack and a number of the underlying virtualization uh, technologies will provide you high availability, doing high availability on, uh, on local storage simply doesn't work. You can't restart it on another hypervisor because it's living on, on a single machine. So you don't get uh, high availability. You don't get that automatic failover. But do you really need it in a dev test environment? And I would argue that the answer is no. There's also some inherent, um, uh, there's also some inherent uh, inefficiency in non-shared storage, right? So um, typically the constraint in a virtualization environment is memory followed by CPU, because disks are gigantic. It's, it's easy to get a one terabyte or two terabyte uh, SAS or SATA disk and have that stuffed into a, um, a physical machine, but you're typically going to run out of, uh, of CPU or memory first. So you, are, you typically will have some storage inefficiency, but quite honestly, the price point's so low that it doesn't matter. Um, so and, unless you're doing this at incredible scale. So um, I think that, that uh, you, from a commodity storage, doing direct attached storage uh, that's cheap and, uh, and somewhat dirty, but I think, uh, I think it approaches uh, doing storage the best from a commodity standpoint. I think cloud computing generally strives for commodity, and when it, uh, you start to, to lose focus when you have to break out of that. Uh, I think that there are very few cases where you can make an argument for uh, doing uh, a NetApp or an EMC. So um, it, the, some of the uh, non-direct attached storage options though, like um, using the RADOS block device out of Ceph um, or using uh, something like Sheepdog, which is uh, a shared block device, um, is possible. Uh, because that's actually using uh, direct attached storage on the host, but making that a, a distributed, uh, distributed file store or a distributed uh, block device. Uh, that is possible. That greatly increases your complexity, though. So I would not, uh, I would not personally uh, jump on that unless you really have some demands that, that uh, require a little more efficiency of your storage. So. Um, we talk about networking and the need to do commodity networking, um, and I can't help but dive a little deep. So, uh, who knows what's the what the maximum number of VLANs you can use is? Four thousand ninety six. Uh, that sounds like a large number. Um, there are a couple of other problems that you run into, though. So, first of all, uh, 
switching and routing hardware, uh, you can buy um, you can buy routing hardware that will um, that will handle 4,096 VLANs, but it's really expensive. Um, I'm talking six, maybe seven digits expensive, depending upon what you're doing. Um, so most enterprise grade, and by enterprise grade, I'm talking probably five digits in expense, uh, networking hardware will handle maybe a thousand VLANs. Um, so that's a constraint that you're gonna have up front. Uh, and even though a thousand VLANs sounds like a lot, start thinking about if you have a developer who needs a multi-tiered environment, uh, you may have a single developer who's consuming three, four, or five VLANs uh, by himself, uh, and multiply that times the number of developers you have. The next problem uh, is the hypervisors typically, depending upon which hypervisor you utilize, may not be able to handle uh, a huge number of VLANs. So you may be, uh, there are some hypervisors that will not handle more than 16 VLANs at a time. Uh, so that may be the underlying constraint. Um, so, so, and maybe I'm, let me jump back and say, first of all, you need to have something that isolates people from a network perspective. Um, you have uh, people who are running uh, ostensibly identical, uh, identical loads um, to what's being in production. You do not want someone to spin up um, a duplicate ERP system that then starts getting production workloads, right? Uh, you don't want to have your uh, real live orders being processed by that ERP system. You want that very safely segregated uh, and isolated away from uh, the real life workloads. So you do need something for isolation. Uh, VLANs are a possibility, uh, but you need to have, uh, it needs to be very small if you're going to do that. You're, uh, simply because it's a, it's not scalable and it's not affordable at any uh, uh, at any scale. So, um, so VLANs can work on a really small scale. I, I don't encourage them. Uh, I think if you look at what Amazon saw when they started deploying EC2, uh, they did not try and use VLANs. They ended up using uh, layer three isolation. So let me. Let me see if I can describe layer three isolation to you. So um, VLANs are layer two isolation. Uh, layer three isolation is essentially at the IP level. So uh, you typically, uh, when you have, and I, can, I wish I had a whiteboard to draw on, but um, uh, in the layer two model, right, so you have, uh, you have a single router or maybe a pair of routers with uh, HSRP or VRRP for redundancy, you have a single uh, choke point that provides that isolation. Uh, all traffic has to flow through that single choke point. Uh, it is both gateway and, and routing interface. Um, and so you can enforce uh, isolation there. You can decide what to route uh, between those various networks. Uh, in layer three, isolation, instead of doing that, you're essentially setting up um, uh, firewalls. But each one of these hypervisors is, uh, is essentially providing a bridged interface. So when you plug the cable in, the, uh, the virtual machines aren't talking directly to that cable, right, on the hypervisor. There's a bridge device, um, and that bridge device then, uh, all traffic, whether it's going to the host machine or it's going to the virtual machines, or even between virtual machines on the same host, has to pass through that bridge. Uh, so if you do filtering at the bridge, you suddenly have, um, you have host level isolation. So the hypervisor is providing the isolation for all of the hosts, and it's providing isolation uh, between the virtual machines on the host, as well as um, isolation out, so you have to um, and it's all denied by default, so you have to explicitly say what traffic you wish to permit. Um, this means that every one of your uh, every one of your hypervisors effectively becomes 
uh, an isolation point, which means it's infinitely more scalable. Uh, we have seen um, people using 50, 75,000 uh, security group rules or collection of security groups um, in production deployment, which is a tenfold increase over what you can do with VLANs with the most expensive hardware uh, and, a, uh, and a hypervisor that would actually handle that number. Um, and so uh, how many folks are familiar with IP tables in Linux? So this is using something very similar. This is using EB tables, which is the, uh, the, bridge, um, the bridge alternative to IP tables. Uh, and also using that in combination with IP set, which, is, which makes uh, such collection of rules far more, uh, far more scalable. Um, yeah, go. Uh, EB tables or IP set? IP set, IP SET. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, so all the question was, uh, are all of these rules pushed out to every host? Um, and yes, uh, because you've got a couple of things uh, battling against you. First of all, you may have host virtual machines that migrate from one machine to another. So within an availability zone, um, uh, all of the nodes within the availability zone will get a copy of all of the rules. Uh, so, and then they will, be checked, uh, they will be checked periodically to ensure that the state of the rules is what the state, uh, the declared state says it should be. Uh, so it will parse updates to those rules uh, as they come through. So uh, in that particular environment, it's 30,000 physical nodes. Uh, and uh, we check, uh, by default, uh, CloudStack checks um, once a minute to ensure state, uh, which means that uh, it, takes, it takes about uh, anywhere from six to 10 seconds for it to audit that many rules and also do all of the network traffic and have the management server actually parse the response. Um, so at any given time, 5,000 uh, 5, or so uh, nodes are being, physical hosts are being checked in that particular environment uh, and they actually do accomplish it once every minute. Um, I don't know that all environments would require something as aggressive as once per minute. This particular environment uh, is uh, highly volatile. They'll spin machines up and tear them down and apply a new set of security rules and they may see 15,000 different machine changes in a single day. So uh, in their case, they actually did need that, but not necessarily uh, applicable to everyone. But you could, you could have it uh, once a minute even at that scale. The second, uh, the second step in network commoditization is uh, getting rid of real hardware. Uh, so CloudStack provides uh, essentially a Linux-based uh, virtual network device that will provide DHCP, DNS, load balancing, um, NAT, port forwarding, um, and uh, you should certainly use that as opposed to having to deploy an F5 or a real Cisco or Juniper router. Uh, while CloudStack can manage that physical hardware, it's a waste of your money, uh, particularly for a dev test cloud. Um, and uh, even some of the mainline uh, network vendors like Cisco and Juniper are realizing that there is getting, uh, it's getting to the point where there's precious little advantage for low speed networks, e.g. E under 10 gigabits a second, um, to be doing that in real hardware. Uh, so virtually all of the network vendors now have virtual appliances uh, and uh, most of those are based on BSD or, or Linux to begin with. So you could follow the same path and allow CloudStack's virtual 
uh, network appliances to provide all of your networking services. Um, I think you need a commodity hypervisor, and right now my choice is KVM. Um, and my choice for KVM is this. Um, it's typically going to be the same operating system that you're deploying uh, as virtual machines. Um, so if you're using Ubuntu or you're using CentOS, you can have that same uh, uh, underlying operating system providing your hypervisor to you. Uh, and uh, so it's one less different thing to manage. Uh, Zen Server and VMware are perfectly fine hypervisors, but A, they're not open source, although uh, Zen Server has XCP available, which is open source, sure. So KeyMU is tip on its own is typically too slow to be of, of great use unless you really need to uh, emulate a different architecture. Um, you should, I don't see any reason for using QEMU uh, standalone. Um, on top of that, uh, most of the uh, infrastructure as a service platforms don't support raw QEMU. Um, so anyway, I think, uh, I think KVM is also the easiest to consume. Uh, it's not necessarily the uh, best performing hypervisor out there. Uh, especially depending upon what workload you're, you're uh, putting on it. Um, but it's the easiest to consume. It's open source. You can use it with uh, Ubuntu or uh, CentOS or RHEL um, and uh, be the same as whatever your other Linux platform that you're deploying is. Um, so, uh, I know, particularly with Russ sitting back there across, with crossed arms, uh, who's, who's angry at me for, uh, for not saying that Zen is the best choice. Um, I do think that if you were absolutely trying to tweak performance, uh, you would probably use Zen. Uh, that's the reason AWS and Rackspace and GoGrid and, and virtually every other public cloud vendor is using Zen as they're, they are trying to get the maximum performance and also provide uh, the uh, highest level of security, and, and Zen does that a lot better than, than uh, um, KVM uh, at the moment, and uh, VMware's just too expensive. Um, and really, I mean, you're trying, to, you're trying to put a test dev cloud and provide value for the business, not necessarily line VMware's pockets, um, even though VMware produces a, a quite nice hypervisor. So next you need to worry about limiting resources. Um, so uh, it's great that you allow people to go out and get things done. You want to do that. You want to make them efficient. Uh, you also want to make sure that you are not the constraint uh, to them getting work done. Um, so you want to be able to limit the number of VMs though. Uh, so essentially what you're trying to do is to ensure that 98% of your users, of the developers uh, that would be consuming these resources can go and get things done without ever having to ask you. For those 2% who want to abuse uh, your generosity, uh, you want them to run into roadblocks so that they have to come and interact with you and, and justify why they need um, a thousand machines playing Doom. Um, or, uh, you know, they want to run uh, their own personal Usenet servers or BitTorrent servers on your network and consume in amounts of bandwidth. Um, so essentially, uh, you want to be able to, to, um, to provide limits against uh, how they will consume things. So that would be number of virtual machines, number of disk volumes, amount of storage, um, you probably want to do a, a broader uh, network offering to begin with to limit, uh, to limit bandwidth. Um, you probably want to control which networks they have access to and how many networks they can actually deploy. Uh, if you provide public IP addresses, you certainly want to uh, limit that, uh, at least if it's IPv4. Um, uh, and finally, you want to also provide ways to, uh, to better group 
resource allocation. So allow people to create this concept of a project container so that you can say, hey, this new ERP development project is consuming uh, 30 VMs, but that's a separate project. That's not, uh, that's not necessarily linked against a single develop developer or development group. So now we're going to stop, and you're going to ask me questions, which you guys have not done to any great deal. Yes? That's a great question. <laughs> let, let, me, let me spend an hour telling you. Um, so, so I will struggle a little bit because I have not heard this question before, but yeah, the, the question is, uh, what is the difference between OpenStack and CloudStack? Um, so from a fundamental perspective, uh, CloudStack was started in 2008, uh, OpenStack started in 2010, so there's about two years of age difference. Um, OpenStack is written largely in Python, CloudStack is written uh, largely in Java. Um, OpenStack is a collection of projects, so if you go and look at OpenStack, they have things like Nova, which is their compute project. Uh, they have Glance, which is their disk image storage. Uh, they have Quantum, which is their network and SDN plugin. Um, and essentially, you decide which components you will assemble uh, to form whatever offering you're looking to provide. Um, their scope is much broader than CloudStack. So CloudStack, um, the primary focus is on compute, and we also consume storage and networking. Um, but we do not, uh, past consumption of storage and networking, we do not provide uh, any storage services. So uh, while OpenStack will have things like uh, Swift that actually provides object storage, uh, we will consume object storage, so we will consume Reox CS or Ceph or Swift. Um, we do not provide things, so we are focused very much on compute um, with, but of course, you know, compute needs to consume storage and networking. Uh, so we're a little more narrowly scoped. Um, so uh, the age difference has essentially meant uh, that we've been deployed a little longer. We had. We had deployments, production deployments uh, at places like Korea Telecom and Tata Communications um, before, uh, before OpenStack existed. Um, and that means that some of our larger deployments from a compute perspective are some of the largest private clouds out there. So we have one that's uh, rapidly approaching 40,000 physical nodes under a single plane of management. Um, uh, from a feature perspective, at any given point in time, the feature sets are, are changing. So uh, it used to be that we would, we would sit there and lay out feature comparisons. Uh, for the vast majority of people, I think both of them provide the ability for people to go in and, and turn virtual machines on, which is the core that you care about. Um, there's a difference in design philosophy, and I think that's one of the key differences. Uh, so. Um, OpenStack is a discrete collection of projects that you can assemble, uh, and it's, uh, in many ways, I, I liken it to a choose-your-own-adventure story, um, because you may choose to implement Swift, you may choose to use something else for object storage, um, you may choose to use uh, Cinder for, uh, for block device, or you may use Nova Volumes. Uh, so, I think it requires a, uh, a higher degree of um, work to customize to provide uh, a finished product. Uh, CloudStack is, is a little more uh, monolithic in that you deploy CloudStack, you have compute services, you may be choosing what hypervisor, what type of storage, what type of networking. Uh, but the bottom line is there's really only one path that, that you go forward to provide infrastructure as a service in the CloudStack uh, model, and that is go deploy CloudStack, uh, then configure it to use the resources that you have and, and let people start consuming it. Uh, so that's a, 
quite a big difference in design philosophy. I think that comes back to, uh, personally, that service provider roots of OpenStack, uh, and uh, as opposed to the product-based roots of CloudStack. Uh, and so, essentially, OpenStack uh, originated with NASA and Rackspace, and I think uh, they wanted something incredibly flexible that they could essentially sit and dictate what service offerings they were going to have. And CloudStack's a product that you go if you want infrastructure as a service. And um, uh, they are both, uh, both perfectly viable um, design philosophies, but they are also very different. Does that answer your question? Okay. What else do you want to ask? No one has another question. Go for it. Can you briefly mention the Clutter Edge case? Mm -hmm. What the consumer was using and things like that? Are there any features, I know you won't get into the feature system, but are there any features already built in to CloudStack tools that the vendor saw didn't have to go to a different plugin? Oh, sure. So, so CloudStack automatically is recording all of these usage details, but it's dumping them in a database. Um, so. Uh, you're either going to have to query the database, dump the database into Excel. There are um, probably eight different external tools that will consume that that I know of. Um, there's a blog post up. Um, if you'll search for CloudStack usage and Excel, uh, there's, uh, there's an article on just dumping it to Excel. Uh, one of the guys at Nokia Labs, uh, they, don't, they don't do true chargeback, but they want to show who's consuming what in their environment. Uh, and so they just dump to Excel. They have graphs off of the Excel spreadsheet and they send that out, you know, every month to people who are, who, uh, to the managers in the development departments. Uh, and incidentally, that spreadsheet is there so you can just directly plug in your, uh, the database details. It'll automatically suck it down and produce the reports for you. Sure. So, so the question is, uh, is there a, is there an API that you can? Um, yeah. Well, they're nice for managers, right? They're not for real work. Um, uh, so. You can dump to CSV, and it, but the spreadsheet is actually making a, um, uh, a database connection to MySQL. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not pulling it down. And um, hang on a second, I'll, I'll drop this onto the screen as soon as it loads the page. Yes, while we're waiting. Today it's MySQL. Uh, we don't use anything that's MySQL specific except for, um, uh, from, a, from a data standpoint, we use nothing that's MySQL specific, but we've never, we've never written uh, the connecting libraries to do anything but MySQL. Um, and apparently everyone is on the internet at the conference and conference. <laughs> Wi-Fi fails. So, um, at that URL, uh, which is, hang on. Well, it's cloudstack.apache.org slash docs slash API. Um, go into the root admin uh, section of that and there's a list usage that will dump that out as XML or as JSON. So you can parse away with whatever tool you want. Yes, sir. So uh, CloudStack has its own native API, which gives you uh, access to every feature uh, that CloudStack makes available. However, uh, a lot of people want, uh, want to use uh, EC2. Uh, and so CloudStack provides a compatibility layer called CloudBridge. Uh, and uh, so 
if you want to use tools like Photo or uh, um, any of the other uh, Yuka tools, uh, you can do that, uh, have this translation layer that will essentially receive those EC2 API commands, translate them to CloudStacks API, pass them on. Uh, so there is that. There's also some talk of um, uh, some development going on around GCE's API as well. Uh, so a lot of people uh, think that GCE will become a dominant uh, infrastructure as a service API in the not too distant future. Uh, they're already talking about porting that. Um, uh, so yes, there's that. Um, I would almost argue though that if you're going to go to that length, you should be using a tool like uh, JClouds or Fog or LibCloud that essentially becomes a, um, an API broker. So instead of writing to a specific API, you write to that and then regardless of where you put your resources in public or private or whatever or which infrastructure is a service platform, it'll take care of the translation there. Yes? So, so it, it's just providing you the, the underlying infrastructure, right? So it doesn't care. Um, there is a big difference in running production in a cloud environment because you have to worry about the type of workloads. Uh, so I see a lot of people who are designing um, their cloud age apps to deal with uh, failure uh, which means that they can tolerate things like having only local disk, and if a machine dies, it's no big deal. You can't do that typically with your ERP system. You care that that ERP system goes down. And so a cloud deployment of your ERP system might involve an EMC or a NetApp SAN. It might involve um, more traditional networking with real physical devices that have failover. Uh, so it looks very different if you're going to do something for production, particularly if it's in your revenue stream uh, or if you've got compliance issues around it. Uh, you're also probably going to be using some of the higher end hypervisors. So you're going to want some of the features that Zen Server or VMware provide you uh, and you know, things like uh, storage vMotion or, um, or DRS that simply don't exist uh, in KVM at the moment. So it looks very different, but if you're just talking about a dev test environment, it's just a virtual machine that your developer has no idea what the underlying infrastructure is anyway, so, and probably doesn't care. Uh, so you know, if it, if it blows up, the impact is to that single developer for a few hours at most. Your developer's doing it wrong. <laughs> there, there's this thing. There, there's this thing called revision control that people should be using. Um, I know they don't teach that in college, um, but uh, and, no, really, they don't. So, so I went uh, three years ago. I was involved in uh, in a program called Teaching Open Source that Red Hat was heavily involved in sponsoring at the time. And I talked to all of the uh, schools with a decent CS program in the state of South Carolina. Not a single one at the time taught SVN, Git, even CVS. Uh, you could get a, uh, a BS in CompSci and never learn about version control, um, which is horrendous. I, I think a lot of them have started changing their ways, but really, uh, these should be thought of as ephemeral instances. Uh, and um, I know a lot of places, I talked about Reservation Engine, they do that explicitly so that developers are actually making sure their code makes it back into revision control and enforcing the, the ephemeral nature of those instances. Uh, because it's, uh, if it lives in a development VM and doesn't actually make it into production, all of that work's wasted. So. Um, there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of places now that are actually spinning up. Uh, they use Jenkins. There's a JCloud's plugin for Jenkins 
that will allow you to specify any infrastructure as a service platform and spin up uh, essentially a stateless node to do, run all of your tests on, then destroy the instance, and the next time the test runs, it's a completely blank slate. It spins up a new image, deploys your software, et cetera. And I've got one minute, so I will shut up. Um, I will leave you with uh, maybe one last thing. Um, If you want to look more, and, and sadly, I didn't talk about, um, I didn't talk that much about CloudStack itself, but if you want to learn more about CloudStack, uh, cloudstack.apache.org. If you need help, uh, feel free to join us on the mailing list or uh, in the IRC channel. Uh, there's a new book that, uh, from Packet Publishing uh, on Apache CloudStack, and of course, the project has tons of documentation. Um, the book, uh, I'm about 50% through it right now, and uh, it's got a couple of uh, inaccuracies, but it's, in general, it's a, it's a good foundation for, uh, for deploying CloudStack, so. Um, and I'm also here today and tomorrow, so if you have questions or want to talk about cloud computing or CloudStack or the demise of most sysadmins' jobs, um, I'm happy to, happy to talk to you about that, so thanks. <laughs>
where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. 
The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked.